afternoon uh, session three presentation uh, continuing the, 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 the John von Neumann uh, life and, and work uh, uh, explanation. The first uh, uh, presenter of the afternoon is, is uh, David Allen Greer, who is uh, uh, writer, author, and, uh, and uh, fellow in the Elliott School in Washington, yes, sorry. George Washington University. University of DC, yes, and, and his topic and, and uh, John von Neumann and, uh, and his, his uh, fields, yes. <laughs> Um, thank you very much. I'm very pleased to be here, very grateful to have been invited. I've chosen a, a title that's difficult to pronounce, <laughs> John von Neumann and the Avaricious Student. <laughs> what I wish to do is help you get a little better understanding of how he worked, of the environment that shaped his thinking. Because without that kind of understanding, it's very easy to think of him as we think of many of the Hungarians who ended up in the United States as aliens from outer space who are just geniuses. There's a process, and there's a process that gives us an insight not only into how he worked, but into how the fields in which he worked developed. So my world is largely the world of computing. I explained to people that I arrived a little bit late for the conference because my plane was hit by a lightning strike and I had to spend the extra night in Zurich. But I'm a mathematician, and I don't believe in physical reality. So it was a mathematical lightning strike that had mathematical consequences, which are computational. This is a well-known picture of von Neumann in front of his computer, the Institute for Advanced Study computer. And we are going to work out from that experience and try to understand what he contributed and how he developed his ideas. I'm giving just one part of what's a very big and a very rich and complex story. These are some of the things that von Neumann contributed to and contributed major works to. Uh, computing, which is central for me, is only one part of them. And the picture, again, a well-known picture of von Neumann. Von Neumann, Oppenheimer of the atomic bomb fame, Hermann Goldstein, one of the developers of the computer, and Julian Bigelow, who was one of his engineers. Um, sort of helped give a sense of the world in which he lived in and the kinds of people he worked with and how different they could be. But the picture I'm really going to start with um, takes us on a different kind of journey. It's a journey that goes from here. This is a woman working in a clothing mill to here. This is, again, a well-known picture, which is one of my favorites for a deeply personal reason. The woman is Lois Lurgens. She's working at the Maniac, which is a copy, modified copy, of von Neumann's first machine. It's at Los Alamos Laboratories. And her daughter, whose name was Lois, that's Lois Lurgens. Her daughter is Susan Lurgens. Susan Lurgens was on my PhD committee. So I have a deep connection to that picture. But we're going to go from one to the other, from, fa from one kind of factory to a computer room, or more accurately, from a computing office, which looks something like this, to, again, the IAS machine, the kind of mechanized computing we all know and understand. And if we're going to just finish this off and do it in an abstract way, from mass human labor and human organizations, represented by this chart, to the von Neumann computing architecture. And in case any of you have, need a quick refresher on the von Neumann architecture, I wasn't sure how many physicists I would be dealing with who say it's just an artifact and not to worry about it. Um, it's useful, as this talk goes on, to remember that he conceived of the computer as a collection of three elements. Um, they were a control device, an arithmetic device, and a memory device. The um, arithmetic device could perform, in his model, the four arithmetic operations, addition, subtraction, multiply, and divide. The control device would tell the arithmetic device what to do and when to do it and what data to get and where to put the data. The memory would store the data, but it would also store the instructions for the control unit, the program. And that that program was a series of instructions represented by numbers, indistinguishable from data, 
and it would be processed top to bottom, first to last, with jumps. He initially conceived it as jumps backwards, uh, a looping kind of operation, but also grasped very early that there were decisions and other options going on that would cause jumps forward. But that's the structure that is attributed to his name and is very much part of the world that he shaped in the late 1940s and early 1950s. And the question that we have to do, sort of answer here, is not only how he got there, but what's the field that he created? I was president of the IEEE Computer Society. Jim Keller is now president of one of my, our sister organizations. And I'm sure he will tell you too that the easiest way to get into a fight there is to walk into some meeting and say, computer science really isn't a science, is it? And it really doesn't engineer anything. A fight ensues and it goes on. Computer science as we know it is an avaricious field. It has taken ideas from dozens and dozens of other pieces of intellectual activity and made them its own. If you look at this list, which is by no means complete, we start with numerical analysis and electrical engineering. For a decade, those two fields fought over who was going to own computing. Um, the IEEE in America, the Institute of Electrical and Electronic Engineers, its members largely built the first computer, so it assumed naturally that it owned them, and they could say what computing was and wasn't. The mathematicians used them, and I come more from that standpoint, and believe that hardware is a figment of the imagination created by engineers to keep themselves busy, and they believed that they owned them. And that fight went on until other things started joining. In particular, very quickly in the 1950s, logic, switching theory, psychology, as a foundation for artificial intelligence. System engineering, all of this were pulled into computer science in different ways. And that started to shape a new field. In the 60s and 70s, we get economics, management. We get game theory, another of von Neumann's great contributions. Statistics, quality assurance. All of these things reformulated and reshaped it. And again, this is far from everything. But there's one thing that we as computer scientists often overlook that has had tremendous impact, and we kind of ignore it, and that is factory operation, factory management. In fact, the management of factories was deeply in the thought of the early computer scientists. They took words from it. They took concepts from it. They turned to the thinkers of that field. In particular, program. We program. We teach kids to program. Every child should learn to program. Comes from what engineers did in a factory. They set up the day's program. They put together a program for the month. Flowcharts, same source. So what does this tell us about von Neumann? And the path we go through is through his computing assistance before he had machines. There are two kinds of assistance. The one which I think is more commonly known and understood were wives, daughters, and students. They were people who were largely unable to have a professional status because of social barriers. Gender was a big one. Uh, there's no, it's not surprising that the word sons does not appear on that list. And they worked because it was a way for them to contribute, a way for them to be part of the scientists' work, a way for them to have any position at all. The computer there is a woman a little bit later than the numbers on the left suggest. World War I, um, she was just breaking out, had finished a degree in mathematics and discovered that that was about the only job she could get. My grandmother had the same experience at about the same time. And the computing sheet is an earlier one, it's from 1799, and we will get to that one in a little bit. But Neumann had a great variety of computing assistants that we know of. The most common ones were new PhDs. Um, Edward Lorch has very fortunately given us a, an article, a very extended, detailed article about what he did for von Neumann. And it's clear that he did everything from take notes. Edward Lorch would sit in, in meetings like this one and take notes, and he had no iPhone to do it for him. He had to do it with pen and paper. He would uh, complete von Neumann's articles. He would do von Neumann's calculations. He did a lot for von Neumann, including more or less keeping his office straight. Uh, von Neumann's wife, Clara Dunn, 
did a lot for him as well. In fact, uh, there have been rightly some questions about what she contributed to him. Clearly, she had some ability of her own that deserves to be recognized more than it is. But she did calculations. She did work writing articles. She did clearly some conceptual things as well. And then there were roughly six to eight young women who were employees of Princeton University who did calculations or programming work after the 50s for von Neumann. Names I have, their histories are vague, the Princeton records are not clear, and of course these weren't students because at the time Princeton was all male. That's the common picture. And if we stick to that, there's not a lot of influence we can trace other than the Edgar Lorch and his crowd. The group that becomes interesting though are the organized computing offices that existed in the 1930s and 40s. Actually, they go back to the 18th century. These offices would employ multiple human beings working together in an organized way that divided large, complex problems into small steps. The one that had the greatest, eh, it's hard to say greatest, but one had a great deal of influence on von Neumann was the Math Tables Project, which operated from 38 to 48. But there were others that employed large numbers of people. The Math Tables Project involved 450. Several were smaller, and we will get to them in a moment. It was, however, the largest computing group of its era. The mathematical leader was a woman named Gertrude Blanche. She was the 35th woman in the United States to get a PhD in mathematics. It was the major computing office of World War II for both the United States and Great Britain. 28 volumes of tables, hundreds and hundreds of calculations. Hans Bethe was a champion of the group. Phil Morse, engineer from MIT, uh, did everything he could to support them. The Army, the Navy, the MIT Radiation Laboratory, the Manhattan Project. They did work for ballistics, radar, navigation. This was the largest computing organization the world had ever seen until we got machines. And it did so as a work relief project. You could only get a job there if you had been turned down for jobs at other places. They reduced all calculations down to elementary operations. They had four divisions. The addition group was the largest. It was about 60%. Then they had the subtraction group, which was about 20%. And then they had the multiplication group, one digit versus a multi-digit number. And then there were the few, the small, the proud the long dividers. And they worked very hard to make sure that the methods that they used would have limited number of divisions. And particularly, they liked continued fractions, which did that. Now, the history of these groups is actually quite old and predates organizations such as it. Almanac offices got it starting. Uh, and these are astronomical almanacs. And the reason they got it started is that they were a regular product. They were ephemerides that were used for surveying and navigation in the 18th and 19th century. They had to be done, particularly for the navigation part, three to five years in advance so that when you left Europe on a long voyage, you would have a star chart that was still accurate. And they first experimented with how do you take a large single computational problem and divide it. The picture is of the British Nautical Almanac Office, which was the first, 18, 1768. Babbage was involved in it. He served on a, a board of overseers for it during the, the 1830s. And there's an example of its early product. They used the tools of factory management of their time. In fact, it's no coincidence that the start of the British group coincides with the start of factories in the Midlands. They read the same books. They used the same ideas. And the fundamental thing was you had common methods, common tools for computing, common input, common product, and a common location to work together, particularly the location so that the computers could train each other and get them up to speed. They also had a fixed management plan and methods for controlling information. And if you look, and I've been told I have a button, yes. OK, that red rectangle, that's the information control device. That was a set of racks, each with different projects on them, where partially completed calculations were put for others to pick them up and use them. 
And so all the additions would be done, as much as could be done. Let's give them to the subtractors. Let's give them to the multipliers. So that process was in there. And what's also interesting is that it relied heavily on the managerial theories of its time. The leaders followed the ideas of Frank and Lily and Gilbreth, who in management theory are very important. They also had a son who wrote a very funny book about them, which is useful. Um, and their student, William Henry Leffingwell, who described information flow in offices. These were the places where those ideas were being discussed. Now, if we go back to that one group, the Math Tables Project, it is an offshoot of the Institute of, for Advanced Study. That's important because that's where von Neumann was. The institutes formed in 1931 uh, by a group of academics funded by a large retailer in the United States. And it was primarily a school for Einstein, a place for him to come in the United States and get out of Germany. But it also had von Neumann. It also had the American Oswald Veblen and two other mathematicians. It was located at Princeton University, and it still remains an important institution in American intellectual life. Veblen um, became the leader of the American math community. He was trained at Chicago. He led a computing office in World War I that did ballistics calculations, very interested in computational physics. In founding it, they found a general director who had been an assistant at the Institute for Advanced Study, Arnold Lowen. He had a PhD from Columbia, very conservative PhD, I would say. It's probably 20 years. It would have been current 20 years before he got it. He served as an assistant for one year, as they all did. And he, too, had difficulty getting a job. He had trouble in that he was Jewish. And most universities were at least partially closed to Jewish faculty. But he was also a difficult person to get along with. And that didn't help his case in the least. Um, there was no permanent employment he could find. He worked for a time as a manager of an incineration plant. And he took the work relief project, as did Gertrude Blanche, because it was one of the few jobs he could get that was involved in his field. No, none of the serious mathematicians of the time would initially touch it. He kept contacts at the Institute. He wrote regularly to Einstein. He wrote regularly to von Neumann. He asked for advice. He gave uh, suggestions of things he could do for them. So it was clearly very much part of that world. However, von Neumann was polite in his replies, but it was kind of those replies of, thank you for telling me what you're doing. It's so good to hear from you. I will get in touch when I need you. And I'm sure that will be soon. And that's all he ever said for much of the time. And as I said, I think Lowen was pushy. And he was difficult to get along with for some people. And I suspect that was the problem as much as anything. However, von Neumann uh, had a friend in England named John Todd, who was a mathematician, young mathematician employed by the Navy. Todd happened to be married to Olga Towski. And I've known, I knew John during his last years, a lovely guy. And I think I am doing him no disservice to say that he was very aware that he was known as the mathematician married to Olga Towski. She was the star in the marriage. He was a good guy. He was skilled. He was competent. She was Olga Towski. And he went where she went. He supported her and was very loyal to her. Um, that meant he did things that he might not have done otherwise. In particular, he stayed in England, and he worked at an organization called the Admiralty Computing Bureau. He led it, which did ballistics, waves equations, the equations for degaussing ships, which was getting rid of magnetic fields so you didn't trip off mines. It was smaller than the Math Tables Project, but it had a longer heritage. It went back. It could trace its roots to the 1878 Greenwich Observatory Computing Organization. Von Neumann visits the group in April 1942. Todd invited him to come to see what was being done for mathematics in the Navy. When he was in London, von Neumann said, sure, something he never did to the Math Tables Project an hour and a half away by train from the Institute. The, this group was then housed in Bath, so the two of them get on a train from London and go out to Bath. As they did it, von Neumann said, how do you divide problems up? How do you make it possible to take one calculation and give it to 12 people? 
and the two of them sit on train. Todd describes it in a method that would be familiar to all of us because it looks like a spreadsheet. And in that conversation, the two of them step by step abstracted the idea and got something very close to the modern program with lists of instructions, jumps back and forth, and calculations to be done. They even worked out the basic ideas of flowcharts at the same time. Now that becomes important about a year and a half later when von Neumann, who is then working at the US Army and doing ballistics work for them, meets Herman Goldstein at this railroad station in rural Maryland in the United States. Herman Goldstein recognizes von Neumann, comes up to him and says, hi, you don't know me. I'm a, a person who hopes to become famous by being your assistant. Can I tell you about the project I'm working on in computing machines and what we're doing? Von Neumann immediately takes interest and agrees to come visit. That project was, of course, the ENIAC. It was located at the University of Pennsylvania. It was doing ballistics calculations, primarily anti-aircraft fire. It was a very complex machine, 18,000 tubes or valves, as they're often called over here. Had a very different structure, nothing like what would become the von Neumann design. It was not operational when von Neumann saw it. And also, it looked a lot more like the math tables project than it did the modern computer. Von Neumann, in getting there, immediately does what Hermann Goldstein said. He looked at it. They finished off the design and lost interest because von Neumann saw it a different way. He reworks the design in a paper called the draft report of the EDVAC. Goldstein was the person who actually did the draft. It's in his hand but he and von Neumann were in constant communications, and this was the opportunity to get the idea caught up. And in the process of this, they put together the first description of the von Neumann architecture. It's vague, it lacks many of the details, but it's the first time we see the modern computer. Now in the process, this becomes quite controversial because it shows how von Neumann works. He went to th activities, he saw things, and he immediately elevated them, abstracted them, generalized them, and provided a foundation for more work. And that's exactly what he did here, except there were four people there who had been thinking about these problems, and they weren't mentioned, and they were quite angry at the process. So angry that when I would interview them later in the 90s and the end of their life, they would still be bitter about this 50 years later. This starts von Neumann's computer research. He gets money from IBM, from a variety of sources, and builds a computing lab at the Institute for Advanced Study. This first of three papers is called The Preliminary Discussion on the Logical Design of Computing Instruments. It is the first discussion of what is now the von Neumann architecture, and it's much closer to the com modern conception of what a computer is. One of the interesting things, though, is this paper, and the breadth of ideas in it is just quite stunning, introduces the idea of flowcharts and says this is a great way to describe computing and computing programs. And of course, the idea of flowcharts at that point was 20 years old. It was in a paper by the Gilbrace in 1921 used for factory management. Goldstein knew that, von Neumann knew that. They didn't feel the need of talking about it because they were moving forward. Now, I don't want to, out of the process, talk about the issue that von Neumann is taking others, but this is part of what he does. He sees things and moves forward. His computer was built here in what is now a child care center at the Institute for Advanced Study. Three elements, 1,700 tubes, and it produced 21 derivative machines, the most important of the lot being the IBM 701, because that's the machine that gets copied again and again and again in the computer industry. During the same period, von Neumann is serving as chair of a committee on high-speed computing devices at the US Academy of Science, which operates a little bit differently than, than this academy does here. It views itself as an advice on science and industrial planning, primarily. The debate they argued about in much of their thing is what is computing? What is computer science? What are we starting here? And one of the conclusions that they came up with was that they wanted, this was something they wanted to pursue, and there simply was not enough talent in the United States 
And because of that, they needed to limit their vision. And von Neumann immediately rushes out and ignores that fact. The computing groups, however, were being disbanded at this point. The Math Tables project was restructured, shrunk, moved to Washington, DC, and uh, was doing far less than it had done just a few years earlier. Von Neumann, however, at this point, did ask for one problem. And that was another problem he had been working on, linear programming. He took the problem, which was you have 88 food items, you're trying to satisfy some basic dietary requirements, and what's the minimal cost? Divided up amongst about 30 people, it took a, a month to do. Von Neumann had wanted to do it on the ENIAC, but he couldn't get access to it. So he did it on his own with this group, and the back of his notes show him translating the work that they were doing into what the ENIAC would do and how fast it would operate. World War II, however, had demonstrated the need for these groups, and yet they were being viewed as being in the way of electronic computers. There are a number of early papers in the late 40s and early 50s where people say we've got to get rid of them because we've got a better method and we want to support that. Von Neumann was dismissive of the groups at this point, saying, you know, they're, they're doing very simple things. He really wasn't concerned about what the workers who had been trained might do. He didn't worry about the methods, in part because we ended up being able to use much more efficient methods for electronic computers because we found it easier to do long division. And so he was generally willing to let the groups go and die. And this picture, I think, somehow summarizes it. This is actually Gertrude Blanche from the Math Tables Project. And this is her view of the electronic computer installed in her office. Not something she was pleased to see. She never mastered programming. But by 52, she and others were beginning to be aware that ordinary scientists, ordinary engineers would not have access to computers. And they were talking that perhaps it would be um, 20 years. And at some level, they were right. Microcomputers, mini computers, are mini computers in particular, are an early 70s thing, and largely were not unavail unavailable to the ordinary professor, the ordinary engineer, the ordinary scientist until then. And there was a need to retain skills and codify the methodologies. That took place under the direction of John Todd. He got a group put together, largely alumni from the Math Tables Project, and produced a book that is commonly called AMS 55. I refer to it as the Handbook of Math Functions. It's one of the largest selling books in the scientific literature, in part because they almost gave it away. But it's largely the work of Math Table Project veterans. This comes out, this work, this last resurgence of computing groups, comes just as von Neumann dies. And really, his death ends the first stage of com the computing era. We're now seeing companies involved. Universities are starting to build programs in it. We are starting to see systems of how you approach the subject evolve. The industry was healthy. There were roughly 4,000 computers in 1964 in the world. And that meant there were enough people who had ideas, who could share them, who could talk about them. There were the a um, ACM and the IEEE were starting to make preparations for a standard curriculum. And step by step, we were seeing the growth of the field. The field, and this is another measure of it. This is Gertrude Blanche again on the left, shaking the hands of US President Lyndon Johnson in 64. Um, this is an evidence of sort of the shift when the influence of this group started to wane, of the computing organizations. And it says, I think, some fairly fundamental things about von Neumann, about computers, and about the world in which we lived. About electronic computers, um, it points not to the influence of these hand workers so much as the influence of industry. It was the means of getting the ideas of factory management into computing. And if you think about it, computers were then, and still are now, a capital good. They replace labor. They extend labor. And they, as a capital good, are more like a factory than an individual product, particularly when you start thinking them, as von Neumann did, as self-replicating automata. What does it say about computer science? Well, again, that's the point I made at the start. It has taken and absorbed ideas 
from virtually every part of human endeavor. And it really shows that one of the foundations, one of the foundations we just don't acknowledge as much as we should, is really the idea of industrialization, industrialism. The basic steps of industrialism were taking manufacturing products, analyzing them, abstracting them, sequencing them, synthesizing the results, and putting them in one place as a factory. And that is actually what we do and is the foundation of what we now describe as computational thinking. It is something that is part of the Industrial Revolution, not something that's particularly new. So what does it say about von Neumann? Again, points to a credible range of intellectual skill. It also points to a certain egalitarian approach. He took all ideas. He took things that were of interest to him. And when he needed, he would um, take a look at them, abstract them, elevate them, look for ways to generalize them, and find, as I said before, putting them on foundations that led to more kinds of results and greater utility. He did have a little bit of a weakness. He didn't often regard who was working in the field already. As I said, I don't think he, he stole and didn't intend to. It's just he got there, he saw it his way, and it became his way even when others were there ahead of him. Ultimately, I think the piece that it says about it is it resituates where von Neumann lives. Going back to the idea that he was one of the, the aliens that came from Hungary to the United States and just was a born genius. It points to the fact that it's not so important that we live in his world, which we do. We live in the world of the computer which he largely outlined and described. It's that he lived in ours and he responded to the elements of ours. And he wasn't working in an abstraction that was disconnected from how we live, how we work, how we produce things, how we manage the information of our daily lives. He responded to common ideas, and he responded to the world around him. And that is the von Neumann that I would like to leave with you on this talk. Presentation. Beginning, I mentioned that uh, the Neumann Society is, is focusing the history of the of the computing. But your presentation was very inspiring because because it's not only equipment history, but is a let's say a institutional insti history of the institutes, mm -hmm. history of the of the of the uh, people, and history of the of the of the. Society, and I think it's very, very inspirational because the hunger is focusing mainly the equipment, and uh, you, you have to, to make a, a wider, uh, a, a wider uh, view. And uh, would like to thank you for the presentation. This is a, the medal of this year, and I hope that you can. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay. The next is a, is a video presentation. Because, uh, because of the, of the capacity and uh, security reason, we are not able to, to, to connect uh, online with the, with the presenter, and therefore uh, he sent uh, send, uh, his presentation on, on our video. The next presenter is, is Peter Denning, uh, who is, a, who is a professor at the Naval Postgraduate School, and uh, he's best known uh, for pioneering work in the vi virtual memory, and uh, and working in this in this field of of of, of uh, uh, development, uh, and uh, and uh, his presentation on the co uh, the topic is compute, computer uh, thinking, and uh, please please show the please show the video is. Hello, this is Peter Denning speaking to you today about computational thinking. Let me begin with introducing myself. Who am I? Well, I'm a computer scientist. I've, I've been a computer scientist since 1964, and I've seen a lot of computer science come and go. I've done work in virtual memory, operating systems, performance evaluation, internet, computational science, 
and innovation leadership. I've taught computer science at MIT, Princeton, Purdue, George Mason, and Naval Postgraduate School. I founded a research institute called REAX at NASA Ames Research Center, specializing in computational science. I've published 13 books. The three most recent ones, images are shown here. The Innovator's Way is about leadership practices for producing adoption of innovations. The Great Principles of Computing is about just what it says. What are the fundamental, timeless principles of computing? And computational thinking is about a specific practice of computing called computational thinking, and that's the topic of the rest of this discussion today. Well, this is at a conference for John von Neumann. He's one of my heroes in history of computer science, foundations of computer science. He was a polymath. He was a virtuoso at calculation. He saw advanced calculating machines as essential for progress of science and technology. He is responsible for the von Neumann computing architecture, which is uh, pervasive in all computers today. He saw many parallels between brains and computers. This, this topic fascinated him. Could computers be brains was one of his questions. I don't know whether he ever got to an answer for that one, but I do know that he was an inveterate computational thinker. Well, what is computational thinking? Well, I use the abbreviation CT for computational thinking. One of the common meanings of it is a K-12 education movement started around 19, uh, sorry, 2006. The other meaning of computational thinking is just the disciplines of thinking to design computations well. <clears throat> well, let's talk about the definition of computational thinking. This is, this is something that's evolved over the years. In the 1960s, when the first computer science departments were being founded, computational thinking was called logical and procedural thinking for computer methods. In the 1980s, 20 years later, it was advanced quite a bit. It was seen as a third way of doing science. Up to that point, science was seen as advancing through theory and experiment. Beginning in the 1980s, science was also advancing through computation. In 2006, we'll come back to this in a moment, there was a milestone where Jeanette Wing published an editorial on computational thinking, and there she defined it as thinking like a computer scientist. A few years later, around 2010, there was a kind of consensus that said computational thinking was formulating problems so that their solutions can be expressed as computational steps and algorithms that can be performed by information agents. And then, at the modern time, uh, now, uh, computational thinking has two distinct meanings. One is designing methods that get computers to do jobs for us. And second is explaining and interpreting the world as a complex of information processes. We should note that computational thinking is not the same as computer science. Computer science, CS, is the field of study of information processes, both natural and artificial. Let's look at the history of computational thinking. It actually goes way back before the beginning of computer science. In the ancients, millennia ago, math, the ancients talked about math-based algorithms and methods. 
for example, Euclid's algorithm comes from that time. Much more recently, around 1820, Charles Babbage proposed a diff difference engine to compute tables like navigation tables for the Navy to avoid human errors. Human errors in the table were common, and the difference engine was going to be able to create those tables without any errors. Uh, Babbage was having trouble implementing it uh, and conceived of a more efficient design, which he called the analytic engine, and it was uh, actually designed for general computation. This was around 1840. He formed a partnership with Ada Lovelace, and they uh, looked at all sorts of issues around the analytic engine, including how to program it. She came up with one of the first computer programs, uh, and she also speculated that this machine was much more general than doing computation, arithmetic computations, and she called it the science of operations, the ability to manipulate any kind of a symbol with this machine. More, much more recently, the United States Air Force published a description of ways of thinking of, for information technology professionals what would they need to be successful? The beginning, near the beginning of computer science itself, the pioneers uh, Alan Perlis and Forsyth talked in terms like algorithmizing, meaning creating algorithms, and procedural methods as characterizing uh, computer science. Papert was the first to actually use the term computational thinking in 1980 in one of his books. He kind of did it in passing and didn't actually propose it as a definition at that point. Then in, in the 1980s, computational science grew up in the other sciences outside of computer science, and it was, computational thinking was seen there as a new way of doing science. Computational thinking in education has also evolved. <clears throat> this is within the computer age you now. The first, first attempts at this were called computer literacy in the 1980s. There were a lot of courses proposed to teach young, young people how to be literate users of computers. They were not, not terribly popular. Then this turned into what was called computer fluency. It's like a, learning a language and becoming fluent in it. So you can not only do the uh, exercise, but you can design in it and explain in it. And that came in the 1990s. Then in 2006 came the Jeanette Wing editorial, which brought computational thinking to the foreground as a way of teaching computing to young people. And shortly after that, the National Science Foundation became an, adopted this idea and was an advocate of it and put substantial resources to promote it in the following years. Well, let's talk first about what is when we're talking about teaching computer science, computational thinking, CT curriculum. What are we talking about? What what are people teaching here? Well, one, generally speaking, we're talking about skillful practices of thought and design. We're not talking about concepts and methods. We're talking about practices. This means you can be, you, as you practice them more and more, you get more experience, you can get better and better at them. There's a spectrum of things you can, practices you can learn, which goes from computational thinking for beginners at the left end to computational thinking for professionals at the right end. Computational thinking for beginners has a whole list of things that people want to teach kids there uh, in various ways. There's a lot of discussion about in the education community about how to do that. But the topics they want to cover are abstraction, data collection, data analysis, data representation, algorithms and procedures, problem decomposition, automation, 
parallelization and simulation. That's a pretty crowded curriculum, so the, the curriculum for the younger people kind of ends there with this list of, of topics. When you get into higher education, the, you start learning all sorts of additional topics which are much more advanced than what the beginners learn. I call these CT, computational thinking, for professionals. Because to be a practicing professional, you better be good at many of these things. So these include neural networks, artificial intelligence, computational complexity, software engineering, operating systems, networks, graphics and images, distributed computing, and performance modeling. I think you can see there's a pretty big difference between basic computational thinking and this advanced kind that professionals need. So the computational thinking for beginners is associated with the K-12 of, uh, education system and computational thinking for professionals is associated with universities, graduate school, and also with professional experience. Well, computational thinking also comes with various misconceptions about it. It's, uh, for many people, it's a new idea. They hadn't thought about this before 2006. They're relative newcomers to computing. They didn't know there was a long history behind it before it came out uh, and started an educational movement. And so the people who have been uh, describing computational thinking and proposing what we need to study have included various misconceptions about computing in their curricula. And uh, I put these in two categories, annoyances and big deals. Annoyances are misconceptions that are you know, minor annoyances. They're not, they don't cause serious trouble, and they're probably pretty easily cleared up by talking to people about them. The big deals are more serious misconceptions that actually mislead people. If they're trying to design software or design new hardware, the, they can get things wrong. And the programs that create will have errors in them, don't perform as expected, and can create harm. So let me go into some of the examples of this. Among the annoyances, uh, is a belief that computational thinking is a new approach to problem solving. Well, I, I hope you can see from the very brief summary at the beginning that there's a long history going back a thousand years of uh, people using computation uh, as an approach to problem solving. So this, this is not a new approach, it's an old approach to problem solving. We've obviously enhanced it in the modern age because we have the new tool, the computer. But it's the idea of thinking computationally is not a new idea. The second annoyance is a belief that everything you need to know about computational thinking is in that basic computational thinking foundation, which I was calling CT for beginners, abstraction, recursion, etc., those, those basic things, which are actually basics of programming. So it's not true that to be a computational thinker, you, that's all you need to know, especially if you wind up growing up and going into a profession, you're going to need to go way beyond that and learn what, we, what I was calling computational thinking for professionals. Another uh, annoying misconception is the claim that computational thinking is for everybody. Well, I, I can think of many, I'm sure you can too, think of many people who don't particularly uh, want to use computers or, or computation in their work, so they don't think about it. So they don't need to know this. They would, uh, if you tried to teach it to them, they'd probably say they're not interested. So this, this is not necessarily for everybody. A fourth misconception is a claim that it's nothing more than logical thinking. 
Logical thinking simply means the ability to decompose a problem solution into steps and then specify the problem solution as a series of steps that follow logically from one to the next. And so being able to do that is called logical thinking. However, computational thinking also includes much more uh, important, larger tasks than simply putting together uh, instructions in a sequence. Uh, it, it has to do with design. How do you design a software system that has requirements and you can demonstrate to the users that it meets the requirements? How do you organize a a software development project with hundreds or thousands of programmers so that it successfully deals a very large application uh, that, that works. So there's more to computational thinking than logical thinking. The, another annoying claim is, is this one. Think, computational thinking means to think like a computer scientist. Well, you can certainly say a computer scientist is a specialist at computational thinking, but uh, is also, uh, you know, if I were a physicist or a chemist or an economist or somebody in another field, I might say I, I don't particularly want to learn how to think like a computer scientist. I have, have enough trouble learning how to be a good thinker in my field. So not everybody wants to think like a computer scientist, yet computational thinking is valuable to them in some forms of their problem solving. So those are the uh, annoying claims. Let me now take a look at the bigger ones that can actually cause harm if people actually act on them. One of them is an ancient problem with computer science is the, the perception that computer science equals programming. So in other words, if you can learn how to program well in a programming language, uh, you have learned computer science. Well, programming is one of many areas of computer science. There's many other areas like algorithms, data structures, and getting even farther from programming is, is graphics and operating systems and databases and uh, networks, software engineering, There's many things that go way beyond programming and they, in, into design of computers, into design of computations. So this is a dangerous perception and, and unfortunately it has plagued the field of computer science for many years. And uh, we thought we had defeated it some years ago, uh, but uh, this misperception is coming back uh, with computational thinking uh, advocates on unwittingly promoting this idea. Another big deal thing is that computational thinking is about algorithms and machines play a minor role. So in other words, the idea is that an algorithm can run on any machine, so uh, machines don't matter anywhere near as much as algorithms. However, when you think about it, this, this claim doesn't make any sense because you can't run an algorithm without a machine. The way we have been taught to think about algorithms, since at least since uh, I went through a programming curriculum, was an algorithm is a step-by-step -step procedure. Well, that idea of step-by-step -step procedure has been around for a long time and is built into the so-called von Neumann architecture, the big contribution of John von Neumann. The, the idea that there's a program counter in the machine and it clicks off one instruction after the next is part of the machine. And this has colored the way we think about algorithms. We have new kinds of machines arriving today. Uh, neural networks, uh, among them the biggies, big type of machine, which doesn't, a different type of machine requires a different kind of thinking altogether. It doesn't involve step-by-step -step thinking anymore. So CT is not about algorithms. Machines it has to be part of it. The architecture of machines has to be part of it. As I just mentioned, 
the definitions that we about algorithms and programs we have in our programming books implicitly assume a von Neumann architecture. It implicitly assumes there's some computational agent going through it one step at a time, following the logical sequence given in the program. Well, th this has been a very powerful notion, has survived for many, many years, since the middle 1940s. And now, today, we have new kinds of architectures appearing on the scene, which are not von Neumann architectures, but which are very important. And we can't think about them in this step-by-step -step manner any further. We, we need to think bigger. Another misleading uh, claim is that human and machine information agents are equivalent. And this is based on the idea that once we have an algorithm written down, a machine can follow the steps, but, but so also can a human. And what's the difference? Is Well, the machine's going to be faster and the human's going to be slower, but in the end, they both carry out the computation. Well, this, this is also a very misleading conception uh, because it's just not true. Uh, they are not equivalent. Humans can do small algorithms and small programs. Machines can do fast algorithms that are very fast and very large compared to anything that a human can do. Uh, I like to think that a, you know, a, a fast-thinking human can do about one calculation per second, and a fast machine can do a trillion calculations per second. This means machines can do things that are impossible for humans to do. And in fact, that's one of the reasons we have machines, is to do tasks for us that we can't do ourselves, simply because we don't have the capability or the time or the resource. So the machines are useful because they are different from us, not because they are equivalent. Sometimes I've heard this claim here, computational thinking is a replacement for computer science. Well, again, this is a misconception about computer science. Computer science is so much bigger and so much broader than programming and algorithms, which is the basic idea of, of uh, computer computational thinking for beginners. So... Computer, computational thinking is not a replacement for computer science. At best, you could say it's a component of computer science. Another misconception is computational thinking transfers to all domains. So what this means is that if you learn how to program, say, or learn how to solve problems computationally, in computer science, in a computer science course, you'll be able to take that skill to any other domain. So you could take it to physics or chemistry or aerodynamics, mechanical engineering, economists, you know, whatever. Well, this turns out not to be true. There's researchers actually studied that and they've disproved this. It does not transfer. You need to have domain knowledge. So a computer scientist that, who wants to collaborate, say, with an uh, aeronautics engineer needs to know some aeronautic engineering and some aeronautic science in order to be an effective collaborator. So it, it just simply having the programming knowledge is not good enough to be able to go work with people in other domains. You have to learn something about their domain in order to be able to, to collaborate successfully with them. So computational thinking can assist in other domains, but it doesn't just transfer over. Another claim is computational thinking applies to all problem solving. So uh, give me any problem and I can find a way to deal with that problem computationally. Well, that's not really true. That's an overclaim. There's lots of things around that we call problems that have nothing to do with machines and computation, like social problems, for example. And uh, so computational thinking does not help us with that type of problem. Another claim is computational thinking is timeless. It's 
getting it's it's bringing out timeless basic principles and it's not affected by emerging technologies well that is also nonsense because uh, we have several new emerging technologies today such as artificial intelligence technologies the machine learning uh, the neural network and, and we also have the emerging quantum computing uh, these are new kinds of technologies they are they're programmed in a different way from von Neumann architectures, and we need to think differently about how to program them and design them. So we are affected by emerging technologies, and in order to be to carry carry forward, we need to constantly adapt computational thinking to the design problems and the technologies that are, are presented to us. Well, those are the main uh, misconceptions. So uh, for the future, I'm looking forward to, uh, as we gain more understanding and more consensus on computational thinking, we are going to see the computation, we will recognize that computation thinking is domain dependent, that it is different for beginners than for professionals, that it is a mental design practice rather than simply a set of concepts. And finally, it's different for different kinds of computers. You already mentioned neural networks, generative AI models, and quantum computers. We have each of those is a different way of thinking about computation. And uh, if we're going to use computational thinking with them, we have to train ourselves, to train our minds in a different way. So, anyway, that brings me to the end of this discussion about computational thinking. If you are uh, interested in, in this, uh, you saw the book that I have wrote with a colleague, Maddie Tidra, uh, on the second slide, and you can go get that book and read more about it there. But uh, it, this is uh, in many ways, a continuation of the way John von Neumann wanted to think about things and and uh, use this kind of thinking for problem solving and design. And of course, uh, in the the book that he put together on co computers in the brain, he was particularly interested in the questions of whether the brain could be a computer and, and or the brain could or a computer could be a brain. Either way. And uh, I don't know whether he's answered that to his satisfaction, but those questions are still with us today. And they still drive uh, a lot of, of science and technology. Anyway, so I'm very pleased to have been able to talk to you for a few minutes on this topic. And I thank you for listening. Okay, thank you. It's interesting that uh, we heard that uh, that uh, 80, 80 years ago that uh, the Neumann and, and similar started uh, a, a new method, algorithm programming and that type of things. That today, this is a teachable uh, thing, but everyone to know, to, to, to survive in the, in, in the future. It's interesting that, that from, the, from 80, uh, 80 years ago, it was a, a scientist knowledge and today it is, a, is every 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 life need to the every, every life uh, this interesting uh, approach and uh, uh, after this this uh, this video presentation we have a <laughs> next uh, uh, presenter is, is uh, James uh, Keller here and uh, he is uh, a distinguished professor at the University of Missouri Columbia, Columbia honorary professor at the University of Nottingham, United Kingdom, and uh, he is president of IEEE uh, Computational Intelligence Society. I hope it's, uh, it's a good, good uh, summary. And, and, uh, and uh, uh, his topic is that you can see we arrived the artificial intelligence after the, the computer thinking. Right, so Please. this is kind of, you always put sort of the, uh the light talk at the end, maybe, to get everybody sort of ready to go home. Um, all right, so, so I I'm, I'm, was happy to uh, come to this meeting and, and have something to say, but I, I, I thought, what could I add to the discussion? Because I'm not 
work, I don't work in an area that's directly founded by John von Neumann. So, you know, I'm, I'm sort of thinking, well, how am I going to make the connection, you know, to, uh, to him? And, and I found out this morning that I'm one of those Americans who really didn't appreciate John von Neumann as the scientific genius that he was. And, you know, I, because I didn't hear about him much, I mean, I knew about the von Neumann architecture sort of as I was going through school, just more, but not a, I didn't appreciate it well enough. And my story, though, is when I was studying for my PhD in math, I, I had to uh, demonstrate that I could read mathematics in German. And so as part, part of the language requirements. And so I found a von Neumann book that had both a German and an English edition. And I used it to, uh, you know, check my translations. You know, and see if I could see if I could translate properly, and you know, and then I'll, another thing I learned this morning is that I was on one of those little tributaries that uh, was far from the source, and so you know, I probably should have paid more attention to the content of the book than just whether or not I could go back and forth. Anyway, so so what am I going to do? I'm I am the president of the IEEE Computational Intelligence Society. And, uh, but the buzzword today is AI, right? Everybody's talking about AI, AI this, AI that. Is AI gonna, gonna are we gonna have an AI Armageddon? You know, is there gonna be Skynet all of a sudden and, you know, and, and humans are gonna be destroyed? And it's, there's an interesting, by the way, if you get IEEE Spectrum or you have access to IEEE Explorer, a, I don't know if it was just the most recent one, they had a, a nice two-page article about uh, many famous AI scientists today uh, and where they sit on the AI Armageddon, you know, whether or not they think, first of all, AI is going to become a generally intelligent uh, agent or not, and then whether it's going to cause destruction of the human race or not. You know, and it's interesting to see who fits where in there. Now, anyway, so that's in there. So my intention today is to is at dissect is too big of a word. Um, you know, I'm going to look at uh, both artificial intelligence and, and what, I, what we say computational intelligence is, and hopefully, like, look at some of the thoughts and accomplishments of Drs. von Neumann and Turing uh, in this AI timeline sort of how they interacted, what their, you know, from what I could gather, what their thought processes were, where they fit on the AI spectrum. And then, of course, how do these large media models like ChatGPT or DALI, you know, or many others now that are out there. I mean, I found out now Photoshop has one. Uh, Word is going to have one soon. I mean, it already does, does projections of what you think you're going to type. Uh, where do they fit into this picture? And in particular, I'm going to tell you what I believe uh, would be the reaction of, of these two guys to chat GPT, you know, in there. And it's just all pure speculation. So, you know, I mean, you can di disagree completely, and that's okay with me. You know, just don't throw anything. Um, and this is, this is more, I, you know, I put this last bullet in there because it's really about me getting ready for this trip. You know, it's my meandering, you know, thought processes. And so I've re I realized uh, after I submitted the, the final version of this, I realized that I've repeated myself in here a few times uh, because of different quotes I found in different places. And so just have to bear with me. So first thing I want to talk about is, is artificial versus computational intelligence. And so... You know, the first, I mean, is it really a big deal? Because you've got AI, and then we, we of course, are the CI, you know. And so the guy in the back there um, points out that it depends on whom you ask this question to, whether there's a difference, and when you ask it. You know, so I wrote a, 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 an editorial in our magazine about what's in a name, you know, whether AI and CI are, di are really different. And so, of course, Everybody's talking about AI now. You know, it's AI this and that. Everything that you, everything we do now, if you can say, well, this is really AI, you know, you get, you know, it's, it's good for funding. Um, but of course, what is it? 
And so when I was a kid, academically speaking, you know, and I was in, I got into the electrical engineering department, and I was told, you need to teach a course on AI, you know, inside EE. And so I knew what it was at that time, and it was just, it was formal logic, basically. It was, it was, it was systems with propositions of discrete symbols manipulated through first-order predicate calculus, and maybe sometimes you had some probability, but it was always on the side. You know, you would do some calculation, probability calculations of the rules, and then, and then you would report that separately. But the rules were all crisp. It was formal logic, and, um, and so that's what I taught, you know, until I found a book that, that also had the word AI, but it was really pattern recognition. And I thought, oh, I like that better. Um, and there were languages that were built and, and machines that were built specifically to manipulate propositions of symbols. So, so, you know, we had some symbolics machines, you know, very expensive for what they could do. I mean, but they ran Lisp in hardware, you know, and so it was, uh, it was that kind of uh, environment that I thought, right? But, when the, so when the IEEE, we, we started out as something called the Neural Nets Council in, in my, my gang, and then we became the Neural Net Society, but they decided to change the name to the Computational Intelligence Society, and it made perfect sense to me that there was the difference between AI and CI, because CI, all of the underlying models for computational intelligence are based on numeric representation, non-symbolic representations functional representation sometimes. So it was a nice crisp partition. Had AI over here, you had CI over here, and they won't meet, you know, in there, I thought. Right? And so the three pillars of, of our society as it's, as it's grown up are neural networks, fuzzy systems, and evolutionary computation, all of which are embedded with numeric representation. And we have a bunch of other related topics that come in here, including, for example, artificial life as part of sort of spun off of evolutionary computation as a topic area within the IEEE. All right. That was supposed to be my symbol for that. I found his little, little digital bugs on the net. Um, but was that ever the case, that they were really separate, that it was a, there was a dichotomy between these? And so then I, then I thought, well, how far back should I go? So I went back to the place where AI got its name, right? And that was the 1955 proposal by John McCarthy and, and colleagues for the Dartmouth Conference where they coined the term artificial intelligence as the science and engineering of making intelligent machines. Of course, none of that, I mean, it's a very circular kind of a definition. Um, but in that proposal, the fledgling area of neuron networks were brought up. I mean, it didn't, wasn't the main result of the conference, as it turns out, because they focused mainly on symbolic logic, right? So, so that's one of the pillars of computational intelligence. So, so even back at McCarthy's time, the partition was never crisp, right? And in fact, it's not even a fuzzy partition. I'm, I'm you know, sort of my, my uh, sub area in, within computational intelligence is fuzzy systems. It's not even fuzzy where you share, you share belonging to either AI or CI, but they, you know, you, you, you can't, you still have a partition. You really have topics that have high typicality in both of them. For example, fuzzy systems, which came up in Computational intelligence really is one of the tools that people use in explainable AI now. I mean, uh, you know, one of the, the big areas in AI is this idea of producing explanations or being able to interpret what's going on, and, and fuzzy rules and fuzzy systems are one way to do that. So, so former president of CIS, Pablo Estevez, said, hey, let's go survey people and see what they think is the difference because we couldn't, you know, we couldn't get a good definition. We were trying to, back in his presidency, he was trying to write a statement, definition, this is what CI is, right? And this is what AI is, and they shall never meet. So, so he did, and uh, what happened is, 
you could imagine every possible configuration of a Venn diagram where you got one bubble is AI and one bubble is CI, and one's inside the other, one's, you know, they overlap. Some, some people said they don't overlap, you know. So it's every possible configuration. There was no consensus. So my position in that editorial was, don't worry about it. You know, who cares what you call it? You know, do good work, have fun, and, and if it helps to call something AI, you know, fuzzy systems AI or, or, or evolutionary computation AI, go ahead and do it, you know? <clears throat> I mean, we are the Computational Intelligence Society, but we're, we are also the Society of AI. And I, I, I put these last three little bullets in there because uh, even though David has absconded, uh, since he was a president, past president of the Computer Society, is that there were four societies that got together to create the IEEE transactions on AI. You know, Computer Society, us, um, System Man and Cybernetics, uh, the Signal Processing Society, oh, and then the Robotics and Automation Society also kicked in. And we also, the first four of those also have created now the IEEE conference on AI, just had the first version in uh, this year, in 23, and uh, the second one will be next time, uh, next, this coming year. Uh, and so I felt pretty smug, as you can see in the picture, you know, that I kind of had this all figured out. By the way, that, that kind of shirt is what I'd rather be wearing right now, but I, I just somehow felt like I, I couldn't, but I guess I should have anyway. Uh, but wait a minute, you know, that I'm being told only back to 1956? What's the deal, you know, by these two guys? So, you know, I, I went back, I started doing a lot more reading. I've been reading and reading and reading and reading. And so, obviously, Alan Turing thought it would happen, right, that, it would, that this would happen. Uh, and he, you know, had the design of the universal computing machine. David, I just put a, a word in for you, but I, I mentioned everybody that you had left. <laughs> Um, that could compute any computable sequence, right, the, the universal computer. And, and his, his, basic principle, his basic thought on this was that it was only a matter of time and a matter of programming, right, that, that in, in fact he, he uh, uh, proposed constructing, he said, well, it's, it's hard to, to, to imagine programming a human mind, you know, the, an adult human mind, so why not just construct a child's brain mind computer with lots of blank pages and then come up with some learning methods? Right? And he said, of course, obviously, the reward punishment scheme is the, is the obvious way to, you know, that you might teach, but it's just too inefficient. So you needed some kind of intuition. You needed to have some learning methods that had intuition, which of course is nowadays, we're all talking about transfer learning, right? You learn a problem on a big data set, right? That's more or less similar to what you're doing and then you transfer right into this. Now I used to think that was all just baloney until it actually I saw it works. You know, at least for, at least for deep nets seems to work. Um, but he never really worked that out, right? I mean, this was, these were more thought experiments uh, at that time, you know, from what I've seen. So he came up then in that 1950s paper, he, he posed this question, can machines think, right? And he said, well, both machine and think defy real definitions. So I need to find a surrogate problem to do this. And so he proposed the imitation game. Right, that, that we've all heard of, even me, back, you know, back even though I didn't know sort of what it all entailed, but we've all heard of the Turing test, right? Where you, where you ask whether or not a machine, well, first of all, it was whether a woman could imitate a man was, a, was the original thing he proposed. And then he said, well, replace the woman by a machine, right, in there. And um, well enough to fool an investigator at where the investigator would have at most a 70% chance of, ID, of, of doing a proper ID in five minutes of conversation, okay? And his, his conjecture was that within 50 years, 
and with a storage capacity of 10 to the ninth. And that was, you know, the idea of storage capacity back then was a little different than we think about it now. I wasn't thinking of bytes necessarily, but, but units, right? Um, of 10 to the ninth, it was possible. That's, this was a, his conjecture in that paper, right? But it was mostly a thought experiment at that time. All right, so this is the standard thing, you know, where you have the, the human and the machine and then the interrogator, right, being separated from them. But I like this version better, uh, you know, where, where you're introducing your, your, spa, your uh, boyfriend to the parents, and they just want to know, going to ask a few questions to make sure you're a decent human being, you know. Um, but how do you tell if the machine is really intelligent? You know, so that this is, so I started reading some bunch of other papers, right? And, and uh, there's a lot of a lot of interesting work going on among the people who are thinking about AI, you know, as well as doing AI. I mean, as engineers, we like to do stuff. You know, we heard that uh, early this afternoon, right? We're we're more more vigorous than rigorous at times. And, uh, but the people who are thinking about it are struggling with ways to assess it. And I did, I could not find, and maybe someone, know, some, someone more knowledgeable than me knows this, but I don't think uh, Dr. von Neumann had a recipe for, for detecting that. You know, I couldn't find, and I couldn't find anything about the imitation game in any of his writings, even though he and Turing worked together for a while at the IAS, and he, he lobbied to get Turing uh, uh, assistantship, I guess, is what it, what it was. Um, you know, but, but he, didn't, he didn't address the imitation game. And so the current researchers are split. This is, a, this is interesting reading, you know, that, that um, many on the pro side of, of these things be, being really intelligent, these new programs being really intelligent, say that these achievements give you at least a glimmer of reasoning, right? Because that's really what they were talking about. And on the con side, it's, it's, more, you know, it's more cautious to you know, say that th this is really intelligence that's going in there. You know, I, I, put these are, I put the references that I've been reading down at the bottom. Um, and so there was a, t apparently, I didn't even know this, but, but apparently there has been a prize every year offered uh, for the, an annual Turing test uh, and for uh, the source of for decades until the guy who sponsored the uh, prize died and the money ran out. So this was right about the time these large language models came into being, you know, the prize is done. Right? So there's no more, no more doing that. And I guess the consensus is that, that the large language models like ChatGPT can win, might win, I mean, because you don't have to fool every interrogator every time, right? You have to fool sort of the average interrogator with a, a probability of, it, I guess, 30% of the time, right? So, and it's a short conversation. And so this group down here uh, tested one and a half million people. They played a version of the imitation game, but the large language models that they used, which I think was ChatGPT4 in there, were sort of primed to act like a human. So they gave the ChatGPT a scenario, it says, your name is Mary, and you, you sometimes don't do calculations correctly, and you blah, 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 blah. And sometimes you're aggressive in your answers, and you know they would prime this thing to, to act more like a person, and the players identified the AI program 60% of the time. So only 60%, right? Only? I thought that was actually pretty good. But, uh, you know, so, so they haven't quite done it. But you can increase the odds, you know, they, they were saying, if you know something about the large language models, how they're trained. So you, you try to put it into a, into a situation that's similar but not exactly the same as what they're trained on, and they'll just spit out what they're trained on. You know, and so that's, that's really how someone who's knowledgeable can, can game that system, all right? But that's really, I mean, what we're asking these, these language models to do is to, is to, to use deceit 
in their training. You know, and so is that really a, a goal for whether, we, whether these are intelligent or not? It's kind of like a parlor trick. And so I thought I would ask ChatGPT what it thought, right? So, I mean, thought, I say, right, about, about its ability. So this was my question to ChatGPT. Could you pass the Turing's imitation game? And so what it did is first it gave me a paragraph defining what, it, what, what the Turing test is, which, of course, is the first thing it spits out, you know, is, is you know, because it's just, it just re giving you words one after another based on probabilities. Then in the second one, it says, whoa, this is a tough test, right? And even though I'm, intel I'm, I'm an advanced AI model, you know, defend, it depends on lots of different things, right? It depends on the complexity of the conversation, who the judge is, blah, 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 right? And then it says, also, I can't do this real time, even though, I mean, that's a hedge, right? The third paragraph's a hedge, right? Because it's saying, well, I can't do it real time, so I can't definitely claim I can do it. But look at the last sentence. But if you have any questions, hey, you know, I'm happy to carry on a conversation with you. You know, so, I mean, this is kind of, this is ch what ChatGPT told me. Uh, so I'm trying to figure out what is, it, what is this artificially intelligent robot see when it looks in the mirror, right? And so what it's really seeing, these things are trained on who? On us, right? It's trained on everything that they can scrape off the web and, and everywhere else. And it's trained on, so they're just a reflection of what we've already said. Right? And uh, this is a pretty cool picture, I thought. You know, I created, but I, but I got it out, I thought I could just go out to Dali and just give it a nice prompt. I wanted a Dali style painting, right? You know, I thought that was kind of cute, you know, to go out to Dali and do that. Um, of an AI robot looking in a mirror, seeing a reflection of people. Because that's, that's the message I wanted to give. But I had to build this image out of several attempts at both people in a mirror, robots looking in a mirror, and, uh, and then I had to use Photoshop and PowerPoint to actually get this to work. You know, so, so Dali would not have passed my visual Turing test in this particular case. Not that anybody else might either. Okay, um, and then I just, just to kind of wrap this part up is that these uh, large language models, you know, have been shown to do really well on benchmark tests. I mean, they're, they can take the LSAT and, you know, they can take the, the board exams for doctors, you know, things like that, and they can do really well on those things. And so now there, people are, are starting to look at these ways to, to, try, to try to measure a little bit more about kind of reasoning, being able to get from one step to another. And this is a visual one where they show a bunch of demonstration pictures where they say, oh, take that first image, you get the second one. Then, then in the second column, same thing. And then show three more at the bottom and say, what would the output image be in each case. Most of us can figure it out pretty quickly. Uh, I don't want to put anybody on the spot, David, but um, <laughs> but anyway, it would it would be uh, you know it's the kind of thing. This is a and the tests that were run in, in, by this group. You know, of course, all these things are published on archive. You know, it's like oh, put it on archive and then run on to the next topic. You know, so they're they're not re none of these are refereed. Um, but, but the large language models did poorly compared to the human subjects that they tested with this. So, how would Dr. von Neumann approach this topic, right? So I started, so I read carefully, you know, his, his uh, book that was published posthumously and a bunch of other articles about him. A lot of people have, have opined on this subject uh, of his connection of, and we just heard it last talk, is, you know, the connection between the brain and the computer, right? And so, you know, a lot of this is going to be quotes that I lifted from the paper, you know, that I sort of thought about this. 
He says he was looking for a way to understand the nervous system from the standpoint of a math mathematician, and he admits that it's just systematic speculation, right? Just his thought process and going. We thought we heard about his thought processes earlier. It was much more cautious than Turing. I mean, Turing was sort of out there saying, "Yeah, it's going to happen. We're just—it's just a matter of of having enough people to program a big enough memory, right? And we'll get it all." And so, you know, it was clear that he investigated these problems one by one, looking from the bottom up in there. And he said that the most immediate observation regarding the nervous, human nervous system, when he's talking about comparing the brain to, the, to a computer, is that its functioning is prima facie digital. So he says, oh yeah, the brain, the brain is a digital organ, but even though it's organized digitally, all of the complexities that we can handle as humans, you need at least, an, there's an analog role or some kind of mixed role of analog and digital in, in this process, you know? And so, uh, yeah, he made a remark. He said, oh, you know, because look, the artificial automata need very high precision because of the air propagation. Right? And you know, significant digits start getting lost if you don't have enough, a big enough representation, whereas the nervous system has low precision, and yet we still do better at reasoning. It has much higher stability, the, the human nervous system. And so you know, he concludes that there's some radically different system of notation than the ones that we use in mathematics. You know? And so he says you can't replicate human intelligence in a computer because evolution was needed to handle loads of uncertain and ambiguous information that, that we all deal with well. Oh well, some of us better than others. And of course, McCulloch and Pitt's neurons had been defined and studied by the time he's writing this, this thing. So he, he understands these mo some models, possible models, digital models for the, the uh, neurons inside of you know, inside a machine. So he could dig down deep into the components. Okay. Uh, he was also worried about the fact that you might not be able to use formal logic in there because to, to represent human knowledge because of this would lead to the curse of, of infinite enumeration. You know, and, and of course, as was pointed out earlier this morning, um, he was well, well aware of, and I, and I realize now he, he proved the second theorem on uh, the incompleteness theorem. And so, you know, realizing this bothered him saying, you know, to, I think my, my impression is that he moved away from a purely logical approach to artificial intelligence in that case. And one of the examples he gave was an example on visual analogy. The fact, if you're trying to describe rectang uh, triangles, two rectilinear triangles, he said, man, there's just an infinite number of ways that you could vary them. You know, they might not actually have all complete straight lines. You know, they might, as you drew them, for example. But people would understand that they're triangles. You know, the angles might not actually be, you know, if you were drawing an isosceles triangle, for example, or a right triangle. They might not, the angles might not satisfy the right constraints perfectly, but people would get it. So if you were going to model all that, you know, you need something more than just formal systems of, of rules. Right? And so what I took from what he wrote is that he thought that, the, that you could use thermodynamics, the air probabilities and thermodynamics to sort of model a lot of this uncertainty in there. I'm going to come back to that in a minute. Yeah, so he says the operation of logic have to be treated that allow things that have very low probability to still be true. You know, and, and that was where he saw this, this inconsistency with formal logic systems, right, in there. And I, this author down here said, oh, well, I work in Bayesian networks, and so that's the answer. You know, but I, I got a question mark there my, for myself. Uh, and of course, We've, we've heard again, and, and have read, that, that you know, he has, has defined this artificial 
self-replicating automata with mutation in there. So he's built the mathematical foundations for artificial life, right, this idea. And, uh, you know, and he's, he didn't get to the next step, which was to breed, to breed the automata which had more complexity than the one that it came from. He's able to do the, do the mathematics to understand the, the sort of how the, how the genome works, actually, right, the human genome, but, but not how you end up with more complexity than you started with. And so, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, let's see, this is one of those places where I, I, I just said the same thing over again. But this was five years before Watson and Crick that he did it. And matter of fact, I, um, one of those two guys, I want to say it's Watson, you know, said without John von Neumann, there would be no Watson and Crick because, uh, you know, he built his automaton, his self-replicating automaton, had three parts. You have the functional part, the thing that actually does the work. You have a decoding section that takes a tape. This is kind of the, the reference to Turing. Thing. That takes a tape, reads the instructions, and builds the automaton. And then you have a device that takes the copy of the tape and inserts it somewhere else. Right? And that's the, that's, you know, essentially how the DNA works. Right? So my take on this is that, you know, I, I was going to say the fathers of AI, but I've, I read that you might call Turing the grandfather and von Neumann the father. I don't know. It just seems wrong. Um, but uh, somebody else thinks it's wrong, too. Um, or else somebody else thinks it's right, and I'm, and, you know, uh, I'm in trouble. Uh, but, I, you know, I see, this, I, I see these as kind of two different ways to attack the problem. You know, Turing the, was the optimist of, of symbolic logic, formal logic, formal systems, you know, and he was using a top-down approach, where von Neumann was looking at the mechanisms, you know, the underlying mechanisms, and seeing if you could put it all together and get to that. Uh, actually, I would rather say is that Professor von Neumann was the father of computational intelligence than artificial intelligence, and that way you don't have to argue about father and grandfather you know, who, which one's which. Um, because he pioneered the analysis of biological and artificial neural networks, part of CIS. His work on cellular automata founded the area of artificial life, which is part of evolutionary computation in our definition. Again, you know, you can argue with me about that. But that's, you know, this idea of, of mutation, you know, in there. And he, understand, he understood and proposed models for dealing with uncertainty in natural languages. Now, he was, he was looking at using the, the probabilities in thermodynamic systems, uh, but that was all before fuzzy sets became available. I'm going to believe, whether it's true or not, I'm going to believe that he would have thought kindly of fuzzy sets as looking at a different kind of uncertainty that's more related to the vagueness of natural language, as opposed to the probability that such and such was true. You know, and uh, anyway, that's my, I'm going to say it. And, and he also, he, this, this idea that, that the nervous system has to have both digital and analog parts, it fits nicely with fuzzy systems, because you have analog-like confidence values that, you know, that you get from stimuli. You manipulate them via more or less analog uh, operations, and then depending on the application, you harden it to a digital answer. All right. So, what do I think these two guys would think of of Chat GPT? You know, as a as an agent of artificial intelligence. Well, this is what I think. I mean, I think Dr. Turing would say, absolutely, it passed my test. Right? Whereas I, I tried to make it not a complete thumbs down, you know, but, it, but my, my thought was always he's, he's much more cautious about attributing these things to intelligence, and I think he would have seen it. And again, I'm, I'm projecting Chat GPT back, you know, back into the early 1950s. Right? And of course, what do you think? Um, so finally, I'm done. I, I really want to thank Emory and, and everybody for inviting me and letting me ramble on for a while. And of course, 
This is as good as Google can help me say and thank all of you for listening. And, and I was going to say, is there any questions or comments, but nobody's getting them. So that's, that's good for me. All right. But this was another, this was created by Adobe's Firefly insert, which is also a, a large language media, a large media um, program that's, that's inside Photoshop now. But it was the same prompt. There's no, there's no mirror, there's nothing. You know, I just couldn't, you know, I just could not get that, get those programs to understand the idea of looking in a mirror, you know, and seeing something other than themselves. I mean, if they did look in a mirror, it was a mirror like, like I had in that picture that I showed earlier. But anyway, I'm done. Thank you. Thank you, Jimmy. It was a really summary and, and, and final presentation. Thank you for, for coming and your presentation. Thank you. And yeah, thank you for this. OK. This is a medal. You may, I mentioned it. Yes. Yes, uh, as, uh, uh, it is the end of the conference. Uh, this is uh, the, the long one year uh, long journey. Uh, because I mentioned that uh, one year ago we met the, the president of the, of the academy, and it was a, the starting point of this, this conference. It was one year uh, long uh, preparation and discussion. And uh, I would like to s f thank you for the, all, the, all the presenter or, or, or speaker this, for this conference, because I think this is a really, really uh, contentful and really, really let's say, uh, 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 good for, 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 for memory for, 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 for Neumann. And uh, I would like to say thank you to the to, 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 to leader of the academy and the staff of the, of the academy helps to, to, to make this, this, this conference. I really uh, thank you for, for the uh, Neumann Associated team as well, who is working to, to, to make this, this, uh, this conference uh, uh, that type of, 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 of uh, uh, level. And uh, I, I think that is, is, is a, I mentioned this, this is part of the, the, the list of the event of this year. In this year, we'll be on, in, in, in November, an IEEE conference with the, with the Neumann section. Mm -hmm. Again, a, a, a scientific conference. The next event will be in Hungary. Every, every end of the, of the September, there is a so-called Night of the Researcher, and uh, we are organizing a program for, for this one in the University of Obuda, and many, many Neumann uh, presentations as well. And uh, if I mentioned your, 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 your web page, the, the Neumann120.hu, there are many other program graphics, uh, reports, books, and others, uh, and, and I mentioned our artworks as well. You can uh, see the artworks that the, the Hungarian uh, uh, artists make for, for this, for this, for this uh, uh, year, to remember for this year. And, uh, and uh, this conference was in the, in the, in the morning was uh, mathematic heavy, and the, the afternoon was the, the informatic easy, but I, I hope that, uh, that it was uh, the, the useful because it's both sides of, 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 of Neumann, the, the, the abstract mathematician side and the engineer side we can uh, show. I hope that you enjoy this, this, this conference and I hope that you can follow the, the, not only the, the Neumann Society but other university and other and IEEE and other institution uh, uh, events and, 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 and works for, for remembering uh, von Neumann. Thank you very much. <laughs>